Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Charles Shapiro, the President of World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Thank you for joining us today. Our program is with Paige Alexander, the CEO of the Carter Center. Today's program is made possible by you, the members of the World Affairs Council. If you're not a member, it's time to join. Uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a toolbar that's got a Q&A function. Please send questions to me. But do me a favor, make them short and make them end in a question mark so I don't have to edit while I'm reading them. Um, I want to welcome a super diverse group of guests uh, from our board at the World Affairs Council. Joe Bankoff from Georgia Tech, Eric Joyner from AJC International, Jim Reed, the CEO of YKK, Dr. Jagdish Sheth from Coizueta School of Business at Emory, got a bunch of consuls general, Vincent Omaril from France, Dr. Sawadi Kolkarni, India, Andrew Staunton from the United Kingdom, Art Vandervoorst from the Netherlands, and Peter Zimmerle from Switzerland. And Paige, our mutual friend, Russell Porter from USAID, registered, and I hope he's on the call. There's also a bunch of people on the registration list whose last name is Alexander. Um, they may they be- figured out Zoom, this is great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Paige Alexander joined the Carter Center as Chief Executive Officer this past June. She's had a distinguished career in global development with over two decades of experience in both the government and nonprofit sectors. She's held senior leadership positions in two different bureaus of USAID, the United States Agency for International Development covering missions and development programs in 25 countries. And for those of you who don't understand USAID, that's the equivalent of being an assistant secretary at the State Department. Both of those positions require Senate confirmation. Paige Alexander is a native of Atlanta and a graduate of Newcomb College at Tulane. She spoke at the World Affairs Council's Global Health Conference in 2015, and that's where we first met. And Paige, the most important part of your bio to me is that you're the newest member of the Board of Directors of the World Affairs Council. So welcome, Paige. It's a pleasure having you here. Thanks, Charles. It's great to be here. Uh, it's, uh, it's not like being on the stage as we were at the West End back in 2015, but I'm thrilled to be part of the World Affairs Council, so thank you. Uh, the food is better at the Westin than, than it is in, in my kitchen. So anyhow, let me, I'm, I'm going to ask. I got my Coke Zero, so I'm good. Good. I got my coffee. You were living in Amsterdam, running a, a nonprofit there. Amsterdam is one of the loveliest cities in the world. And yet you chose to move home to Atlanta. What, what were you thinking? I, uh, you had those four letter words in there, home. Um, it is. It was really nice to be in Amsterdam, and if, if our Van der Voorst is on the CG from the Netherlands, we chatted yesterday, but uh, I do deeply miss the Netherlands and Amsterdam, but this was such a wonderful opportunity, and uh, the concept of being home, where my parents are, where all three of my brothers live, and the place that my husband and I actually originally met back in 1988, I uh, was really excited. So as my mom, as my parents like to say, it, it took me 35 years of visiting other places before I came home, but I'm here now and I'm excited about it. So, so how is it returning to Atlanta after 35 years in exile? Let's just say I'm very appreciative for ways. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how I would find my, my way around any place. Uh, 400 was new when I left. And um, so I continue to get lost, but you know, Atlanta is <clears throat> truly becoming a capital for global health, uh, everything from the task force for global health and the Global Health Alliance, as well as Emory, really, really builds out a community here on global health that the Carter Center is part of. And on top of that, you now have the Atlanta Peace Initiative, which is uh, also a very important part of bringing some of these human rights issues. So in the middle of a global pandemic and backsliding in democracy, the fact that the Carter Center works in two primary program areas of health and peace means that the timing for this could not have been any more perfect for me. So I'm excited and I'm really looking forward to what the Carter Center can do. 
That's cool. To, speaking of timing, today is President Carter's 96th birthday. Happy birthday, Jimmy Carter. Uh, he and Mrs. Carter are supposedly retired full time and living in Plains. A couple of questions. What's the Carter Center like without the Carters there? And what kind of contact do you have with them? Do you, do you talk to them daily, weekly? How, how does that work? Well, the Carter Center currently is 37 acres without anybody here, except for me, uh, because uh, when I came back, I was working at my parents' dining room table for the first couple of weeks and decided that maybe being in the office made a little more sense, and since no one else is here. Um, but the offices are closed, and you know, President and Mrs. Carter used to come up one week a month, and uh, you know, obviously during COVID, that's probably, you know, it's certainly not going to happen, and we'll see what happens post-COVID. But their interest and their founding principles that set up the Carter Center are, are really the North Star for us as far as you know, making sure that we follow those, those direct lines. And, uh, and that's an important part. I have been down to Plains a couple of times, a few times, and I had, you know. It's, it's a longer uh, ride than you think it is. It is. It is a longer ride, but it is a part of South Georgia I certainly had never seen before. So, you know, I left here in 1984, and even though I've been back a lot to visit my family, uh, Plains was not on the places that I visited. So it was exciting to go down there, and it was very, um, it's indicative of a place where he came from and everything that they stand for in the place they wanted to go back after they left the White House. And you get a sense about the integrity, about the feeling in, in really a small village or a small town. Uh, and that's what's carried forward with President Carter into the work he's done, you know, and the center's done throughout Africa, Asia, Latin America. For him, he's seen it. He's, he, you know, he's seen what happens when you have uh, deteriorating healthcare systems for rural farmers. And he understands that. And so that really was what has driven him. You know, we, we talk and we still talk uh, quite often and he is swimming and walking every day. They're both still very outgoing and in, in the bubble that they have in Plains. And, you know, part of what he has continued to say is we need to be unique and we need to be bold. And so it's, uh, he's very much involved. Although he is retired between the transition of Jason Carter, his oldest grandson, who is the chair of the board and sort of my main interlocutor now, uh, they still have opinions and, and we still have conversations. So it's, it's nice to have that guiding star out there. For me, it's very nice. Speaking of the guiding star, I mean, does he, when, when, when you got the job, did he give you some advice that you've, you know, put on the wall? I mean, what, what's the Jimmy Carter advice to the new CEO of the Carter Center? Uh, so anyone who knows President Carter knows he, he does offer advice, and uh, he was very clear. He said it's really important to be unique. You know, we have to find a unique place for us to be because not every donor wants to do neglected tropical diseases. And he's, as he says, you know, there are no neglected diseases, they're neglected people. And so approaching things from that element for me has been sort of that has been my guiding principle because I know that's how they look at it. And I've had this conversations with Jason as we were driving down to Plains the first time. Uh, and it really, and with my husband and my kids when we went down to Plains, they sort of looked around and said, this is where our president of the United States came from. And it tells you a lot about the integrity and the, the really grounded position that he had going into the political office as well as post-political office, you know, what he thinks needs to be changed and what should be addressed. And I think that that's sort of, it's nice to have that anchor for me. How different is that from USAID and the nonprofits that you've worked in? I mean, is there a, a, a different orientation? Is, have you had to, is there a cultural shift that comes with that? Yeah, uh, sure. Well, uh, Charles, you know, uh, from having been at State Department, there is a definite cultural shift. There is a, a set of bureaucracies that are overly involved when you're using U.S. taxpayer dollars. Uh, and I think that that for foreign aid and what USAID did, that was an important element of things I had to pay attention to. And even as we were talking about today's conversation, and you said no prepared remarks, you know, now that I'm out of government, I'm sort of 
out of the box and I don't have to worry about prepared remarks uh, because I'm not worried about changing national security. I'm worried about talking sincerely about the work that a nonprofit organization does. And so with many, you know, I've worked at IRAX, I've uh, worked when I was in Amsterdam and Brussels working with an NGO. It's, you know, it's all about the people we're working with and you have a different boss set up in that structure. You're not adhering to US taxpayer dollars. You do have uh, donors who are, you know, who want impact and, and metrics, but it's all about the people you're working with. And so that's why, even though I've done government and NGOs and academic and back into government, coming back into the NGO world is what I feel comfortable with. So I'm, it's uh, nice to be here for that reason. And I bet you don't have all those lawyers telling you what you can't do and what you can't say. I, mean, I always found that to be so. No, just a lot of compliance officers telling me what we can and can't do. But uh, aside from that, uh, I can speak freely. Yeah, that's cool. So the Carter Center, I mean, I'm not sure people in Atlanta know that there are 3,000 employees, 3,000 staff spread around the world. Yeah. Um, but even those in Atlanta are working remotely, as you said. So how do you take over a large organization during the COVID pandemic? I mean, well, that's gotta be an extra challenge. Sure, it's an extra challenge, but I think all of us are dealing with being uncomfortable with technology and trying to have these conversations in this virtual setting. Uh, so I think I've probably been cut a little bit more slack because I'm taking over as a CEO remotely. But I've also had a lot of really good one-on-one -on -one time with um, a lot of the staff in a way that you couldn't if I was sitting up here in my office and 3,000 staff people were spread between 225 in Atlanta and, you know, and 28, 2,900 overseas. So I've actually been able to have these conversations a little bit more effectively because of technology. And again, everyone is in a strange position with the, the current situation. And so I think people are willing to probably cut the new new person a little bit more slack, and so. The, the, it, I mean, this is not scientific, but it certainly seems to me that the Carter Center is is the most successful of the centers, foundations, all the names that former presidents have started in their post presidencies. Um, I mean, it really has a huge impact around the world. Um, the, the title that we put on today's program is Building on the Success of the Carter Center. How, how do you do that? How do you not just maintain what you've got? How do you build on what you've got and take it further? Well, I think going back to the Julia Coleman quote that we were talking about, uh, maintaining principles during, you know, un, unchanging principles is sort of the crux of what we have to look at. You know, we are going to stay in health and peace. Those are the areas that are important to us and we're going to continue it. But there are innovations that we can do throughout those, uh, those, those program areas. You know, just with COVID alone, you know, we're not going to pivot our programs. We still need to do mass drug administration for river blindness and trachoma and, you know, a number of diseases that we work on. We have to teach people how to properly co collect water for getting, you know, to get rid of getting warm. These things have to continue, but at the same time, we can message out behavior change uh, and awareness on COVID. And so it's almost like adding an extra layer to the work that we're already doing. Um, at the same time, the world's changing and we have to look at the digital threats component. We've got to talk about, you know, conflicts, uh, mitigation and violence among sort of political extremism and, you know, both over there and here. And so, you know, we're making some adjustments, but I've, you know, I've talked to all the other presidential foundations and we do a lot of work with the Bush Institute. And you, know, we're you have to keep your programs going, even in the midst of all this. The question is, how do you fold in, where's the additionality? and your programming that can actually affect other people because 3,000 people, 28, 2,900 overseas, they're all local. I mean, these are people who actually have credibility in their villages and in their countries. And so we're not sending a group of expats in to say, this is how you do things. You know, when, when we send people in to, add, to teach villagers how to better collect water, things they've done for generations, 
and they listen to us and it changes the, the whole aspect of public health. And so, you know, we'll continue to do that. And if we have to weave in additional messages on COVID or violent extremism, those get weaved in. You said at home in the United States, um, you, the Carter Center, for the first time are taking on a project here in the United States. Can, can you tell us about that? Sure, well, so we, um, so this first week I was in, in this office, we actually issued a statement on racial injustice in the US. And it was something that was truly staff driven in many ways. And uh, as I have mentioned before you, we ended up having this be actually written by the staff, which is probably a management nightmare no one really wants to consider doing because you know, drafting by committee is, can be very difficult. But it really was the crux of, of our feeling here at the Carter Center about racial injustice and about the reawakening that the US is going through. And that led to a series of critical conversations about what should the Carter Center do? We're an international NGO, but we've seen elections in 111 different elections in 39 different countries. And is there something we can bring to bear here? Now, people think of the Carter Center as election monitoring and observation. But keep in mind, and I'll just use Georgia as, as an example, we're, this, you know, we're the second largest state as far as numbers of counties. We have 159 counties here. That's 159 different elections. Unlike being overseas where you can have uh, a central election commission that you work with to make sure everything is, is folding, you know, unfolding in the way it's supposed to, you can't really do that. So our election observation monitoring wasn't as relevant here. But our public education piece, our voter education piece, uh, transparency, those are all messages that we've had in 111 different elections. So we're actually bringing that forward right now, as well as the conflict mitigation, post-election violence, and those elements. So we're, we're gonna be working on everything from transparency issues, we're working with the Georgia Secretary of State's office, probably on a bipartisan commission, uh, we'll be looking at uh, perhaps a risk limiting audit after the election to be able to go in and get in front of the glass on looking at making sure that the votes were tabulated properly. Um, we'll be doing, a, we'll be launching next week two different uh, uh, videos sort of in the Schoolhouse Rocks theme for those of you who remember Schoolhouse Rocks. Who can't forget it, yeah. yeah. Conjunction. Uh, I'm just a bill. So we'll yeah. be launching those. And again, it's, it's the voter education piece of it that's so important. Uh, we'll be working with journalists who are otherwise, um, especially minority journalists who are covering the election. And, and this is a very difficult time for them. So how did you do it in a way that is not even further polarizing? Um, we'll be talking to uh, about election, elections writ large in the the online infodemic on October 7th for, for anyone who's interested. And if you go to the cartercenter.org, get involved page, you can look at what some of our online programs are. Um, but talking about the virtual uh, online infodemic, we're, we're having a lot of information come to us at once. And how do you figure out what those messages, where they're accurate? And fortunately, uh, Secretary of State here and in many other places, they have ways to track your ballot. And so making yeah. sure people understand, because it's going to have to be a number of voices if for any reason, you know, the, the question of this election, the credibility of this election has been questioned. We, we all saw that in, uh, you know, in what we read in the press every day. So but, Tuesday night, it was questioned by one of the candidates. Yes, and so we have always spoken out. The Carter Center, if we see something like that, we will speak out. And so unfortunately, we would be considered very partisan in the US, whereas overseas, we can come in and Liberia is not gonna think that we've got a partisan take in their election. Um, here, they would. So every place we, we work, we're trying to be nonpartisan or bipartisan, and, but we will have a voice and we will speak out because it's important. We have to question these things. But it's individuals' responsibility, too, to track their own ballot and to make sure that when they have a voting plan and that they're sharing good information and not faulty information. Are, are people suspicious? I mean, just to take Georgia, the Secretary of State of Georgia, the, the guy that runs the election is a Republican, was elected as a Republican. Uh, Jimmy Carter's endorsed Joe Biden. Um, and he's and obviously he was a Democratic president. I mean, to, are 
they suspicious of your motives when you get involved? No, actually, they, uh, Jordan Fuchs and the, the Secretary of State's office has been very inclusive of us. And I, there's, there hasn't been suspicion, um, but we've also made it very clear we have to be independent. And they've respected that. And so, you know, we've called them on a few things and we've had good conversations about it. And, uh, and those are conversations that need to happen because if we just jump to conclusions on either side, then you're setting up, um, you're setting up feeding into the narrative that there is a lack of credibility. And so I think our voice is very important in that and they think our voice is important in that. And so we'll continue to have that voice. The Carter Center have a view on presidential debates. Uh, there's supposed to be three of them, right? <laughs> so uh, I don't know about rule changes. And uh, so no, we don't have a view on that. Okay, I apologize. Uh, that's me being snarky. Um, no, no, no. Okay, so you, you arrive from Amsterdam. You, 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 I mean, you live, your office is right up the street from where I live. You go to your office, you start looking at the Carter Center, opening up everything. Uh, is there a program? Is there something that just surprised you and you just said, God, this is wonderful. I didn't know we were doing this. I mean, tell me about the coolest thing the Carter Center does that you didn't know about. Ah, there, there are so many because um, on, you know, when I left government, as you'll appreciate, I was worried about conflict of interest. And I had worked in the democracy and governance field for quite some time. I'd worked in the Middle East and, and uh, Eastern Europe and the former Eurasia region. And I was worried about conflict of interest. So I said, I, I can't work in any of those places. So when I went to the Netherlands, I worked on African agriculture, thinking no one's going to question that. It has nothing to do with my previous government service. So I spent three years sort of decompressing from, from the angst that, uh, of my previous sort of position, Syria refugees, humanitarian crises. So when I came back in, I had always known of the Carter Center and the peace work and the election observation work. I was not aware of all of the health programs. I was not aware of the mental health programs that we run, that Mrs. Carter has been focused on for 50 years, and we'll be celebrating her 50 years of uh, attention to this. And in the middle of COVID, when you are trying to destigmatize things like mental health, and we've worked so long on that, and now all of us are struggling at the same time with issues like this, I was really pleased to see how active our mental health program is. On top of the neglected tropical diseases, which I didn't, didn't know much about, uh, it's been really interesting. So. Um, Everything surprises me because I think we punch well below our weight. I think that we, you know, again, as President Carter wants to be unique, he also has never been somebody who has stood up and said, we need attention to this. And so we actually don't take up as much space in a public way as, uh, as I think we should. And so people like me didn't have the understanding of all the work that we do here. So that's an area I think I really want to expand upon because it's impressive. I'm going to ask some of the questions coming in from the audience, and let me remind everybody, please send them using the Q&A function, not the, not the chat. Makes it easier for me. Um, first of all, they're easier to read. Um, so this is from Coleman Younger, who asks, how can young professionals get involved with Carter Center? So if you go to our Get Involved uh, tab at the Carter Center doc Org, you will see that there are ways to get involved through internships. I think our next internship for the spring class is due October 15th. And you know, usually we have a whole set of interns on the Peace Pavilion and you know, we must have 40 monitors set up there that the interns would normally sit around, but we are still doing our internship program. So please look at that. Uh, and again, logging into these webinars and some of the conversations, October 7th and 8th next week, we'll be doing two which I highly recommend. Well, oh, Michael Stimpert asks, who are the major contributors to the center? Uh, so one of the other things that has been such, <clears throat> so wonderful for me to see is the diversification of funding that we have. Our major contributor, contributors in many ways are private individuals. And President Carter in the center has spent so much time talking about our programs to individuals that that is one of our major funding sources. We do go through standard USAID, you know, DFID, uh, Dutch Embassy, Mimbuza. I mean, we, 
we have funding from a number of governments, but almost all of our programs are done in partnership with Carter Center funding and other donor funding. That's great. Edward Shartar asks, how has the Trump administration changed the work of the Carter Center? Um, trying to find a way to answer this it, it, to black, it, it really, it hasn't. This work needs to be done regardless of who is in power here in the US. Uh, we are a last mile initiative type place in many of these countries. And so the effects of, of things in the US really don't have that much effect overseas in the places that we work. Access to justice, access to information, you know, transforming women's lives, it, you know, all of those things don't have much to do with administration here. Has the, has the funding via USAID increased, decreased? Uh, is that during the Trump administration? Uh, you know, I, I, I can't answer that over the past four years if we've seen a major increase or decrease. I think it's been fairly stable. You know, those who work in neglected tropical diseases don't really, it, it's, it's flown under the radar screen of political decisions here. So, uh, I think our, our assistance with OEPA in Latin America, with Anca Sarais, you know, and USAID, that, that has continued, and we've been very fortunate in that respect. Julius Coles, who is a dear friend and is the honorary consul of Senegal in the Southeast, asks, what do you hope to accomplish from the innovation hub you have established? And he's got a capital I and a capital H on innovation hub, so... I'm guessing it's a thing. It is a thing. It's very much a thing. Uh, so a couple of things. One, Senegal, my daughter just spent half a year there uh, for her junior year abroad and loved it. And um, uh, so our, so we've established something called the Innovation Hub. And Marianne Peters, my predecessor, had actually started the establishment of it. Uh, but through my conversations with the board since I've started, we've incentivized it. So we have used our own money and put it forward and we'll have a pathways for proposals so we can have both internal and external funding, uh, internal and external ideas from, when I say internal and external, I mean from our field staff and from the staff here, but programmatic and operational. My feeling is that the staff here has so many ideas and I don't want us to always be responsive to what donors want because we see so much on the ground. And it's really important that a lot of our programs be organically grown. And so I wanted to get some of the best ideas from our field staff and moving those forward to make sure that we're making the adjustments that the Carter Center needs to in the 21st century. And you know, President Carter says we should be taking risks. That's always been part of the Carter Center mantra. And so this is a chance for us to take some risks. And I'm appreciative that the board has given us a little bit of money from a from our own programs to be able to do that. Carolyn Aidman asks, Georgia is the worst in maternal mortality. Uh, I assume she means in the US. And the US is 17th worst in the industrialized world. Um, are you working with the Emory Urban Health Initiative on this in Atlanta? So uh, maternal, infant maternal mortality hasn't been an area that we have focused on. In, in my previous life uh, with IREX, we actually, I, I know these facts from Georgia, um, and we actually had worked with Iran, of all places, who, who have an excellent midwifery program, and, and we had you know, used some of those lessons uh, and had done exchanges. But, um, the Carter Center hasn't worked in that area, even though we work very closely with Emory. That's not one that, that we've done to date. Uh, Gita Merota asks, Merotra, pardon me. I work with Indian media. How can we work together? Uh, please elaborate on, you know, what, what can she do? What can Indian media do to work with the Carter Center? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, Gita, I would be more than happy to talk to you offline uh, about our programs in the region and, and see if there's some way we can collaborate together. We have an Inform Women, Transform Lives campaign that we're just launching, and so perhaps there is something uh, in the region that would be relevant. Syed Kamal says he's got some ideas, some suggestions for you. Right? How does he send them to you? How does he get it to the Carter Center? Uh, thanks, Hassan. I think that you know, we do not take unsolicited proposals. I mean, I'm always happy to have a conversation uh, about international health, and we are fortunate enough that today is the first day for 
Dr. Uh, Kashep Ijaz, who is our new Vice President for Health, for Global Health, and he is coming to us from the CDC, so I'd be happy to put you in touch with Kashep. Okay, cool. Figure out how to work that out. Um, Sloan Hardin asks, what can interns do to support the Carter Center? Are there any programs, projects that are not on the Carter Center website? Uh, so Sloan, and I apologize if you're one of our interns, uh, I, you know, Lauren Cantelani has set up a, a wonderful internship program where we actually plug our interns into our existing programs. And so all of those programs are on the website, except for maybe the ones that we're still thinking up and dreaming up. And so as an intern, usually we are able to place you in with a direct um, report as a direct report to a program director so, so you can get I, 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 I got the sense he's not an intern at the Carter Center, but interning somewhere else. So what, what can somebody who's ah. interning somewhere else do to work with y'all? Um, so again, look at the get involved. Um, sadly, if we were still having our in-person meetings, I'm sure there's a lot more that could be done. But if you look at the get involved tab on our website, you can see it just attending meetings and having these conversations you know, things will come out of that that might be relevant, so. Thomas Stahl asks, what is your vision for the Carter Center? Do you have a specific initiative that you have rolled out or you're planning to roll out? Oh, hello, Tom Stahl. I assume this is the former counselor at USAID uh, and human director of the humanitarian office. So, um, you know, again, part of, I think part of leadership is coming in and listening. And I, we've had such, uh, 2020 has been such a crazy year. So as far as my vision, my vision is to carry on the vision of the founders and to continue doing those programs, but to find innovative ways to do things that are modernized. And whether it's using drones to put abate onto ponds to make sure that we are keeping, uh, keeping the larva at bay so people are not getting guinea worm or our distribution of ivermectin, or increasing our mass drug administration programs to a triple dose therapy. All of these things are things that people with much more scientific knowledge than I have are thinking about. And so my vision is to be supporting some of these uh, new innovative technologies. Uh, Diane Aleva Casades, who's a good friend of mine, uh, asks, how do you resist the pressure during the time of COVID to cut programs that make Carter Center unique while also paying attention to the future needs? Well, fortunately, we have not had to cut programs. I mean, uh, President Carter has been, as everyone knows, very fiscally conservative. And so we, he has been saving for a rainy day, as he told me early on, and I have had conversations about this being that rainy day. And uh, so we haven't had to cut programs and we have amazing donors who really believe in the work that we're doing. Uh, and that goes from government donors who are giving us extensions because we have been limited in our ability to do some of the work to individuals who recognize that, that this work still must go on. So I fortunately I haven't had any pressure to cut programs, but we have tried to make sure that we, again, the additionality of, of bringing COVID conversations and integrating it into some of our public health discourse in the field is part of what we are doing. All right, Trevor Williams, have you met Trevor yet? He's the publisher of Global Atlanta, uh, an online magazine, and you should meet him. He says, how are you integrating the use of technology in your public health work and combating extremism, which often takes root online? So it's, a, it's two questions for, wrapped and in one. On one for, is- Yeah, and then he went on for a third, I see. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're skipping the third. You only get one okay. question. Okay, uh, so integrating the use of technology in public health work. Again, uh, um, we are looking, we have to do assessments. Our trachoma program and Kelly Callahan has done a wonderful job at setting up assessment tools to make sure that we can get involved again in mass drug administration. You know, sometimes as Frank Richards likes to say, we're the ham in the middle of the sandwich in that Governments want to restart these mass drug administration programs and the donors are hesitant to have us do it. So we've had to lean on the assistance of other donors to try to get masks and to make sure we have PPE so we can get back out into the field. And so, you know, integrating technology, that, that's everything from an iris tech, you know, trying to um, 
look at the iris of a dog so we can tell exactly where they're going uh, and we can track them in a way that are chipping them so we can track them so we can see if they're spreading guinea worm. You know, a lot of this is, is new, new to trying to track a disease that you're trying to eradicate. And so whether it's doing, using assessment tools and uh, data to make sure that we're evidence-based in the work that we're doing, or whether it's finding new ways to do the work because we can't be there or we can't be, we can't follow a dog everywhere it goes. So if it's got guinea worm, then we have a problem because we can't actually hire a staff person to follow the dog, but we can tell where the dog's been and, and we can work on programs to tether the dog and um, anyway, so th that's how, that's a little bit about how we're using technology. And as far as combating extremism, a lot of the work we do is still very much person to person and having conversations. And I was talking today to someone about um, combating extremism as a behavioral science, as this is something that it's a lot about education. It's a lot about everyone making sure you understand each other's lived experiences. And once that is understood, people actually come at issues from a different place. I don't want to be Pollyannish about it because, you know, it's hard to, it's easier to get some people to sit down than others, but um, combating extremism when it takes root online, we do have a digital threats program. We're working on this in Myanmar. We're working on this in a few different places to uh, be able to pull those together and take these things offline. Jorge Fernandez with the Pendleton Group asks, has the center been involved with the Global Smart Cities initiatives regarding government services for citizens, particularly in healthcare delivery? Uh, Jorge, I don't think we have. I mean, granted, I've only been here three months, but that's not one that's come across my screen, but I am taking a note and I will check with our folks. Cool. Gail Evans, um, who knows everybody, uh, says in your work, through IREX, you created entrepreneurial programs with international women. Is the Carter Center looking to expand into areas such as this? Uh, thanks, Gail. Gail, whom I owe a debt of gratitude because she was actually the one who told me about this job uh, or told the headhunter about me, I should say. Um, so my mother thanks you as well, Gail. Uh, so in the, in the work with IREX, yes, we've done a lot with entrepreneurial programs back then, but we are launching a campaign this week, and Laura Newman uh, on our staff is in charge of it, working with 10 cities throughout the, the world to talk about informing women and transforming lives. And this is a follow-on to our Access uh, to Justice program. And so those 10 cities have not been, you know, we've had applicants from about 20 cities, so we have to figure out how to narrow that down, but um, that is going to be a major focus. Michael O'Reilly has human rights protection has long been a key focus for President Carter and the Carter Center. Will this continue to be a major focus? What challenges or opportunities do you see in this area? Um, yes, it will continue to be a major focus. Uh, you know, as, as you may know, President Carter actually was the one who started the Democracy Rights and Labor Bureau at State Department, which essentially is the conscience of the State Department, and since 1977 has put out uh, yearly reports uh, about human rights in all of the countries where we have diplomatic relations. So, um, yes, it will continue to be a focus. I see lots of challenges. And those are conversations that we've had. We had one two weeks ago, also including uh, the Bush Institute about some of these challenges and human rights uh, issues, especially in the time of the global pandemic. And I, there's been a lot of really good work by, done by the International Center for Nonprofit Law and other partners of ours that are really looking at how our current situation right now, what are the challenges, but more importantly, what are the opportunities? Where can people get involved where can this become a citizen-led change uh, and sort of citizens holding up a mirror to these issues so it doesn't come from organizations per se, but it comes from individuals. I'm, I, I, and I'm, I've got a comment here. I was actually working at State Department in 1977. I was the juniorest guy in the building. I had to sweep up at the end of the day. <laughs> and I got to tell you, there was such skepticism among the career foreign service about the State Department should focus on human rights, that we should be judging other countries on their human rights performance. Um, and, and almost derision. 
Um, and it's interesting to see how much now it's just part of the DNA of State Department. Um, and it has become part of the, 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 the institutional culture of State Department, but that cultural shift was really hard to achieve. Yeah. Well, I, I just saw a quote by Lawrence Ziegelberger, who, uh, who I think was the ambassador in Belgrade at the time. Every time that Pat Darian, who was the assistant secretary at DRL, would come in, he would leave town because he knew that she was just going to browbeat Tito and, and you know, it was going to be a mess. And he has he since came around and said, although he was skeptical, he realized the important role it played. So, um, yeah, I think it's a good checks and balance. And as I said, it's a conscious within the State Department. And I hope it continues to have focus. And where it doesn't, NGOs will. Yeah, exactly. Kwon Suk Lee, who is the Deputy Consul General of Korea in the Southeast, says, I personally witnessed devoted contributions of the Carter Center as an international monitoring participant. Okay when the national referendum was held in Sudan in 2010. Does the Carter Center still have an ongoing activities in South Sudan or neighboring countries? Yes, uh, that's great that you were part of the referendum in Sudan in 2010. Um, and I, I literally just did a Facebook Live with the Minister of um, Information and uh, Youth in Sudan about doing an international observer group of having youth go out and start talking about the follow-on after uh, the change in government in Sudan and the constitutional reforms and holding the government accountable. So we're still very active in South Sudan. We have a number of programs we're working. Uh, Guinea Worm is, is probably our biggest program there. Sloan Hardens, back for a second question. He, <laughs> He's, he's got more to come. Does the Carter Center have any LGBT initiatives? If not, does it partner with to support uh, governmental or other NGOs, LGBTQ programs? So uh, we don't have any, to my knowledge, and I apologize, but again, I'll, I'll pull the three month card here. Uh, to my knowledge, we don't have specific LGBT programs. However, having said that, we do partner with organizations that do cover these issues because it's part of, it's a human rights issue. And in many countries we work with, it's a human rights issue. And so it's part of our overall discussion in our democracy programs and our rule of law programs. So uh, I would say it's not standalone. It would be integrated into our other peace programs. I mean, so here, here's the final, final question. If the people on this Zoom today want to make a contribution to the Carter Center, how would they do that, Paige? Well, there's always the donate now button, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> if it's a financial contribution, uh, which can be restricted to a specific area if, if you're so interested. Otherwise, just you know, being part of the conversation for us is a really important element to being both part of the community in Atlanta, as well as being part of the global community. And just as the World Affairs Council does, having these conversations and making sure people know each other. You know, it's, it, although it's a shame we can't network in person, the reality is we can still network this way. And we're very fortunate that technology allows us that ability to do so because we can spread the word about what the Carter Center is doing. We can look for additional partners in an online venue that you might not be able to find necessarily if you were waiting to have a coffee clutch with someone. Uh, so I, I would ask that you follow us on Instagram, on all of the social media, um, I, this is, you know, it's the new normal and it's something that we're all struggling with, but I think that these connections uh, through the World Affairs Council and others is a great way to bring us together. So uh, please look at the cartercenter.org and look at Get Involved, look at Donate Now and check out each of our programs. And if there's an area you're interested in, there's usually a contact name at the bottom. Hey, I, this has been great fun. I wish we could go on longer, but I promised you 45 minutes. I want to thank you, uh, Paige Alexander, the CEO of the Carter Center, and I want to welcome you home to Atlanta. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks for making me part of the World Affairs Council as well. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure. We've got some upcoming programs. Next week, we have a members forum with Jonathan, i try to say that again, Jonathan Reckford, the CEO of Habitat for Humanity. It's a members forum, so that means it's only for members. You can join and become a member. And the idea is to have it small, everybody have their cameras on, 
so that people are talking to each other during this. So please join us next Tuesday, October 6th, and pull your calendars out. And on October 21st, we're going to have the ambassador of India to the United States, Taranjit Singh Sandhu, for what's going to be a terrific program. I want to thank our executive director, Fernanda Lucchini, and our business manager and producer of this program, Valerie Lopez de Franc. I want to thank all of you for staying with us and watching this program today. And I'm going to urge you again, please join the World Affairs Council. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Bye, Paige. Bye.